the congregation of a certain Presbyterian church took pride in their pastor's brief, to-the-point sermons. For years, he preached for exactly 10 minutes, briefly prayed, and then launched into the final hymn. One Sunday, however, he preached for 45 minutes. He suddenly stopped, reddened a bit, bowed his head, and gave the final prayer. When he got home, his wife lit into him. She asked, what on earth happened this morning? Chagrin all over his face, the preacher explained, I usually put a cough drop under my tongue just before I speak. When it is dissolved, I know it's time to stop. This morning, I discovered too late that I put my collar button under my tongue instead. Whether we listen to a 17-minute sermon, a 30-minute sermon, or a 10-minute sermon, worshiping and praising God is the most important part. That is what our scripture is about today. Our scripture reading is from Psalm 145, verses 1 through 5 and 17 through 21. The book of Psalms was actually created over a very long period of time. It contains some of Israel's earliest texts. Our text, our text today is from the fifth book of the Psalm, which comes after the return from exile and begins the restoration of God's people. I will be reading from the King James Version of the Bible. The Psalms are so beautiful and the words sound so comforting in this version. Hear now the words of the Lord. I will extol thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day I will bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall play, praise thy works to another, and should, shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty, and of thy wondrous works. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. The Lord persevereth all them that love him, but all the wicked will he destroy. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy One, you have promised to be with us. Long ago, you sent your Holy Spirit to abide among us and guide us to a future of goodness and hope. We come seeking your truth, your justice, your kindness, O oh God, as you are with us this morning. Let us feel your presence and welcome you into our lives. Amen. In 1886, a Swedish preacher named Karl Bober wrote a poem called, O oh Great God. The very, con the very condensed cliff note version of this story goes like this. Bober was inspired to write the poem after walking home from church. As he and some friends walked, a thundercloud appeared and soon lightning flashed and the rain came down in cool, fresh showers. When the storm was over, a rainbow appeared. When Bober arrived at home, he looked out of his window over the lake that was still and reflected like a mirror. From the other side of the lake, he heard church bells. So he writes his poem. An old Swedish folk tune was soon set to the poem, and later, Bober sold the rights to his poem. It was translated from Swedish to Russian to English, different music added to it, and now we have the version we know as How Great Thou Art. Now Paul may disagree with some of my timelines and exact history on the hymn, but for now, we'll just go with it. The first line of Boberg's poem tells of God's greatness and the awe and inspiration he felt walking home that day. O Lord my God, when an awesome wonder, consider all thy worlds thy hands have made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. 
Who here hasn't marveled at the greatness of God in all his creation? But not all of God's greatness comes in big displays of rolling thunder or meteor showers. God's wonders are also displayed in quiet, gentle ways. And we see this in the second verse of How Great Thou Art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander, I hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down from lofty mountain grandeur, I see the brook and feel the gentle breeze. When life gets too busy or stresses invade my brain, I like to walk in the woods near my house. I hear the river, I see the changing colors of the trees, and perhaps a few deer in the distance. And I sense God's presence, and soon I feel a peace that lets me remember who I am and to whom I belong. Psalm 145 is how great thou art in biblical form. Let me read the psalm one more time. I will exalt thee, my God, O King, and I will bless thy name forever and ever. Every day I will bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. One generation shall praise thy works to another, and shall declare thy mighty acts. I will speak of the glorious honor of thy majesty and thy wondrous works. The Lord is righteous in all his ways, and holy in all his works. The Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of them that fear him. He will also hear their cry and save them. My mouth shall speak the praise of the Lord, and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. It is hard to imagine a better text for this Sunday, our stewardship kickoff. Psalm 144 speaks, excuse me, 145 speaks of God as creator and a source of abundant blessing. But what exactly is stewardship? In the simplest terms, stewardship is the wise management of God's resources. Stewardship is, that, is what one does after he or she says, I believe. Psalm 24 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it the world and all who live in it. So stewardship is as much about living as it is about giving. Stewardship is God's abundance. It's not just about paying the bills or covering the budget, although that's important too, but it's our participation in the world. Stewardship is the response to everything in Psalm 145, God's goodness and the vision of how things are supposed to be and how God intends things to be. In his book, Theology of the Old Testament, Walter Brueggemann writes about the way God sets things up, the way God establishes a viable, life-giving, life-permitting order, a place for life. A place for life. The church should be a place for life. As it was stated in the stewardship letter that you all should have received by now, and if not, surprise. In the next several weeks, we will be invited to reflect on how we individually and communally are stewards. We will be asked to reflect on how Second First represents, as quoted in the letter, a way of being church a way of practicing one's faith, a way of interpreting God's word and the times in which we live, a way of articulating the hope that is within us, a way of intellectual honesty and courage, a way of creating a new ecosystem for the church, a way of sustaining a movement, not a moment, a way of doing justice, seeking peace, and building community. We can prayerfully consider the way Second First can be a place for life, whether in our neighborhood outreach or how we can care for each other. Stewardship is the hope for the world. It is, a sharing, it is the sharing the overflow of blessings from God. Every day I will bless thee, and I will praise thy name forever and ever. Thy Lord, my God, when in awesome wonder, consider all thy works the hands have made. Let us join together in giving our time, talent, and treasure in a way that seeks to love, know, and worship God 
by welcoming all people, serving our neighbors, and energizing downtown Rockford and beyond with God's grace. Amen.